Well, good evening, everyone. I am Kevin Maurer, the South Fayette Middle School Associate Principal and one of the organizers of the South Fayette Township School District Speaker Series. We are delighted to extend a warm and heartfelt welcome to each and every one of you that attended our first event of the series this evening. Um, your presence here is truly appreciated, and we're thrilled to have you join us for this enlightening occasion. We would like to express our deep gratitude to our esteemed partners with, without whom this event would not have been possible. Um, their commitment to our community and education is truly commendable. Our three sponsors or, or partners for our speaker series are UPMC Children's Hospital Foundation, the uh, Kidsburg Parents as Allies, and SF Shout, Student Handprints Overcoming Unjust Treatment Club. So their support has made it possible for us to bring you an exceptional presentation this evening that promises to be both informative and thought-provoking. We'd also like to thank the South Bend Administrative Leadership Team and Board of School Directors for their unwavering support of programs and initiatives such as this one tonight. Our speaker's insights and stories will undoubtedly leave us a lasting impact, and we are excited to have him as part of this engaging series. As we gather tonight, we celebrate the spirit of learning, community, and progress. Your presence adds to the vibrancy of this event and your engagement enriches the discussion and helps drive the mission of our guest speaker. So thank you again for being a part of this special evening. And to introduce our speaker this evening, I would like to invite my colleague, friend, speaker series co-organizer, and South Bay Township School District Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging, Dr. Chuck Karen, to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Mauer. Uh, I am really excited about today. Uh, I'm actually wearing this sweater. Let me take off this. You can see my whole sweater. Take a look at this sweater. It's great. Uh, I'm wearing this sweater today because um, our speaker tonight, uh, Mr. Gibson and I, we belong to what is part of what's called the Divine Nine. And the Divine Nine are the nine black Greek letter organizations. And ours happens to be the first and the best. <laughs> <laughs> and we're actually brothers in this organization, and part of this organization, uh, this brotherhood, actually has uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Jesse Owens, Thurgood Marshall, and just a litany of other people who have made American history. And so I'm really honored to be here to represent the, 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 the colors of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and to introduce my brother, Sean Gibson. So, Sean Gibson is the great grandson of baseball Hall of Fame legend, Josh Gibson. Sean has dedicated his life to the preservation of Josh's legacy and is the executive director of the Josh Gibson Foundation, a Pittsburgh area nonprofit organization. The Josh Gibson Foundation was established in 1994 in an effort to keep the memory of Pittsburgh's beloved Josh Gibson and the entire Negro Leagues alive. The foundation partners with the University of Pittsburgh, Duquesne University, and Carnegie Mellon University by matching up college students with elementary and middle school youth for tutoring. With a strong focus on education, the foundation currently serves roughly 300 children and plans to increase those numbers by starting new programs yearly. The foundation also sponsors the Josh Gibson Baseball Academy. Josh Gibson, the man who many regard as the greatest Negro League player ever, and some regard as the greatest baseball player ever, <laughs> was born December 21st, 1911 in Buena Vista, Georgia. He, wrote, he, relocated, he relocated in to southwestern Pennsylvania in 1924 after his father found work in the Pittsburgh area at Stillwater. He began catching for the Pittsburgh Crawfords in 1927. With the addition of Gibson, the Crawfords rose to the top of the city's Sandlot teams and challenged Cumberland Posey's Homestead Grays, a stellar club of black professional baseball players from across the nation. During Gibson's career, he played ball with Hall of Famers Oscar Charleston, Cool Papa Bell, Judy Johnson, and Satchel Paige. The Homestead Grays won an unprecedented nine consecutive Negro National League pennants with Gibson behind the plate. Due to sporadic statistical accounting, and the Negro Leagues, reports vary regarding the number of home runs Josh hit, with some estimates as high as 962. During his career, Gibson never played for a losing team. Moreover, it was rumored that the Pittsburgh Pirates owner, 
Bill ben Benswager signed Josh to a major league contract in 1943, a full four years before Jackie Robinson entered the league. But Major League Baseball Commissioner Kennesaw Landis would allegedly would not allow Gibson to play. And just as a side note, most people don't know this, but the Pittsburgh Pirates were the first team in Major League Baseball history to also have nine black players play at the same time. So, in addition to possibly being the ones to try to break the color line, they actually were the first ones to have a whole team. Oh my God, which blows my mind. And we were a lot. Yeah, so a little bit. So, Josh died suddenly, January 20th, 1947, a few months before Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in the major leagues. Gibson was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1972, being the on only the second Negro Leagues player after Satchel Paige to be so honored. So, enough of me. I'm going to get off the stage and bring up the man that you all came to see, Mr. Sean Gibson. <laughs> My, he did everything. He said everything, and my speech is done. <laughs> I did it all. He said it all. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, I want to thank South Fayette and the staff for having me here today. Um, it's great to be here and talk about the little history lesson on Josh Gibson in the Middle Leagues, especially since we are here in Pittsburgh. Before I get started, how many of you guys heard of Josh Gibson? Okay, a few. Okay. How many heard of the Homestead Grays or the Pittsburgh Crawfords? Okay, okay. Well, tonight you'll learn more about it. Um, we have, uh, I know some of you had a chance to see some of our memorabilia over there. Um, a lot of that stuff over there has been passed down to me from my grandfather. So Josh Gibson is my great-grandfather. My grandfather is Josh Gibson Jr. He also played in the Negro Leagues as well. And so a lot of the things that you see, people always ask about, you know, are there any real artifacts of Josh Gibson that we may have? Um, and so all those things over there are just replica. I mean, it's a remake. Um, so the uniforms, it just kind of gives you a feel of what they play. So the, the uniform that you see, if you touch them, they're wool. So the actual Negro League baseball players, when they play, they play in a wool uniform. They play in two or three games a day. You'll see that section over here, all these Hall of Fame plaques. So Josh, as Chuck mentioned, he's in the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, second Negro League player in 1972. Other plaque over there, he's in, so a lot of the Negro League players, that's why you see the Latin ball, they played overseas. So they would play, they call it never drop the ball. So they played baseball all year round, so that's why you see the Latin ball. Um, so you see the Mexico plaque where Josh played in Mexico, his Hall of Fame there. Then also, Pennsylvania, every, every, he was played in Pennsylvania, so it's the Pennsylvania Sports Hall of Fame. And lastly, well, two things, the bet. It's a replica bat of Josh. It's the bat that he used, when he, the size and the weight of the bat that he used when he played. And we get a lot of questions about the, um, the Nike tennis shoe. So if you look at the tongue on the tennis shoe, it has his name, Joshua Gibson. And so um, this was back in 2007. We did that. So we also have a company called Josh Gibson Enterprise, which I own their rights. So whenever you have a famous athlete, you, have, you can own their rights with the name and image, just like NIL right now. Name, image, and likeness. So we was doing that before it became popular. And so I own Josh Gibson's rights to his name, image, and likeness. So we do deals with Nike and Tops and Major League Baseball. And so that shoe there, and people always ask us, why do we do Veracruz? Because on the shoe, it's Veracruz. At the time, we, did, we decided to go with Veracruz instead of the Homestead Grade or the Pittsburgh Crawfords because at that time, and still today, there's a lot of Latin baseball players playing baseball, Major League Baseball. At that time, it was getting more popular of Latin players coming into Major League Baseball. So that's why we decided to go with the Latin team. And so that's why it has Vera Cruz on the shoe instead of one of the homestead grades of the Pittsburgh Crawfords. <coughs> Excuse me. So, as Chuck mentioned, um, I'm the great grandson of Josh Gibson. Uh, I attended Edinburgh University. I graduated from Edinburgh University in 1995. My major was criminal justice. I do nothing but criminal justice, but I have a degree. Uh, the most important thing is that, you know, when I talk to young people is that, you know, follow your dreams. I played basketball in college. Uh, I went to Robert Morris first, and I transferred to Edinburgh University, and I finished there playing basketball. People always ask, well, how come you didn't play baseball? I wasn't good. I mean, I played baseball, but <laughs> basketball, it was good, it was free, and I got a free education. But 
You know, I know there's some who play sports. I know Gavin plays baseball. Anyone else play sports? Chloe? <laughs> Here. What's your name? Kingston. Kingston? What you play? That's the basketball you ever got on? Tennis and golf. Tennis. Oh, why you got a basketball shirt on? <laughs> I used to play that. Okay. <laughs> Tennis and golf. Okay. She's sweating. Your mom's sweating. Play <laughs> <laughs> soccer and basketball. Soccer and basketball. Okay. Chloe? Basketball? Okay, okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through this PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to show a video. You can get the video plan. Give you a little bit of understanding about this. Now this video was done, this is, this is a clip, about seven minutes. This video was actually done by anybody at Duquesne University grad? Anybody by Duquesne grads? This video was actually done by Duquesne students. Um, we have a documentary on Josh Gibson, about a 50 minute video. I mean, a 50 minute documentary was done by Duquesne students back in 2010. And he actually won an award called a Telly Award for their great work. You want to turn the lights down, so I'm sure. Josh Gibson. His Hall of Fame numbers are staggering nearly 800 career home runs, blasting baseballs out of ballparks like they were rockets. A skilled defensive catcher, he was a master at handling pitchers, and his powerful arm cut down opponents on the base paths. Josh Gibson's performance on the baseball diamond made Pittsburgh the epicenter of the Negro Leagues. So many legendary tales. If he wasn't the best baseball player of all time, he was clearly the best player never to make the big leagues. Who was Josh Gibson? You have to go back to the very beginning to understand Josh Gibson, the legend behind the plate. This documentary is for all races. Uh, our goal through the foundation is education. Uh, we want to use this to educate the youth, not only on Josh Gibson, but the Negro League. We feel like this is a very, very important part of our history, whether you're black, Asian, white, Hispanic. Uh, this story of Josh, <laughs> will be from beginning to end. Beginning going to Buena Vista, in from Buena Vista to DC to Pittsburgh. It covers all parts of his life. Josh Gibson was born on December 21st, 1911 in Buena Vista, Georgia. His parents, Mark and Nancy Gibson, were sharecroppers in this rural Southern town. Josh, the oldest of three children, had two younger siblings, his brother Jerry and his sister Annie. In the segregated South, job opportunities were limited for African-Americans. The railroad system provided great hope for black families in Buena Vista and throughout the country. By the year 1920, trains were carrying thousands of African-American families to northern cities for a new way of life. My grandmother's cousin came first and got the house. And then my grandfather came and he got a job. And then he sent for my mom and uh, my, uh, my two uncles in to come. Many of those families in the South found out about the economic opportunities by reading the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper. The black newspaper vigorously pushed for equal rights. And even though the publication was banned in many Southern cities, copies were circulated by railmen who distributed the newspaper from city to city. Columnists and reporters detailed the manufacturing jobs, and black men were being hired in the bustling plants and factories. When my grandfather came, he went to work at American Bridge. That's a job he had. When he accumulated enough money, he sat and got the rest of the family. Gibson comes to Pittsburgh uh, as a result of the Great Migration of African Americans out of the South that remakes this country in the early 20th century. His father left Buena Vista, Georgia, where he was a sharecropper uh, and got a job in one of Carnegie's mills in Pittsburgh, um, probably a little bit after World War I. Seven years after Mark Gibson and his family hopped the train heading for a better way of life in Pittsburgh, that same Pittsburgh Courier newspaper would help launch the baseball career of Josh Gibson. By 1921, Mark Gibson landed a job at the Carnegie Illinois Steel Company 
and settled a family in the vibrant Pleasant Valley neighborhood of Pittsburgh's North Side. Josh enrolled at the Allegheny Pre-Vocational School, where he attended until ninth grade. When the classic game in 1930, when the Pittsburgh Crawfords and the Homestead Braves played for the first time, they had played at Forks Field. There were a huge crowd, 17, 18,000 people for that kind of a, two black teams playing together, you know? And that's when Josh had just made his change from the Sandlot Crawfords to the Homestead Graves. Josh spent lots of time studying the players on Homestead Graves, hanging around the team that grew to be a powerhouse during the 1930 season. Cumberland Posey, the owner of the Grays, inserted Josh into the lineup on July 25th during a game against their rivals, the Kansas City Monarchs. Josh replaced Homestead catcher legend Buck Ewing and remained with the team the rest of the summer. The exuberance, uh, belly busting laugh, and he always had a lot of winter smile on him. He was just a fun guy to be around. They claimed he never ventured a serious moment. He was just jolly good, a jolly giant who liked to play baseball and enjoyed the good life. Uh, not a serious fellow, a wonderful teammate, and a pleasure to be around. And that's the Josh Gibson that they told me about. Quiet and reserved. The teenage phenom let his bat do the talking for him, hitting home runs in bunches, helping to carry the Grays to the championship series. But he was just a natural athlete and a natural baseball player, and a strong audience. He had a record of throwing out batters who tried to steal on him, you know? In September, in a game against the Lincoln Giants at Yankee Stadium, Josh Gibson smashed a home run into the left field bullpen. Newspaper reports claim the monstrous blast traveled more than 500 feet, calling it the longest homer ever hit, farther than Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. Josh became an instant hero. Newspapers reported his every move, and as Josh and the Grays barnstormed throughout the country, fans filled ballparks. In 1939, um, Clark Griffith, who owned the Senators, called Josh Gibson and Buck Leonard, his teammate from the Grays, into his office and said, uh, how would you boys like to play in the major leagues? And they said, well, we'd, we'd like it fine. And he said, you think you could hit these pitchers? And they said, well, some of them we could, some of them we, we could. We, we, we probably couldn't. We're like anybody else. Um, and so Griffith then said, well, as soon as somebody else signs a black player, then I'll, I'll come calling. Well, Griffith could have been the pioneer. And, and had he chosen to just simply take the best players off the roster of the Homestead Grays, uh, uh, you know, Leonard, Gibson, uh, uh, Papa Bell, the Senators would have had a dynasty. Baseball never would have left Washington. They would have been the Yankees of the 50s and 60s. I tell the people and the kid, take pause in how we come from, that you can do a lot better than we did, and because we've made it possible that you can play in any league any way you want to now. These athletes were so passionate about the game of baseball that they were willing to endure whatever social adversity confronted them as they traveled the highways and byways of our country just to play baseball. And what the Negro Leagues teaches us is very simple. In this great country of ours, if you dare to dream, you can do and be anything you want to be. So I'm going to ask a question again. So how many of y'all heard of Josh Gibson? You should already know now. I just... <laughs> so I'm going to just go through a quick presentation. So this is a young Josh Gibson. So Josh actually went, you heard it there, he went to Allegheny. He's a Pittsburgh Public School student um, with the Allegheny and Conroe on the north side, grew up on the north side. As you can see, uh, because he started playing baseball at a very young age, he never finished school. He, the highest grade he attended was ninth grade. He started playing baseball very early, playing sandlot baseball. That's a picture of his, uh, his eighth, I say, actually, actually it's an eighth grade picture that we have found of Josh Gibson. So you're here to talk about Buena Vista. This is where they were born and raised at. So Buena Vista is a small town, it's about two hours outside of Columbus, Georgia. Um, no, I'm sorry, about two hours outside of Atlanta and about 30 minutes from Columbus, Georgia. Very, very small town. Actually, this weekend, I was supposed to go there this weekend. They were actually naming a park after Josh Gibson. Um, which they, they, they moved it to next weekend. But as you can see, they have a water tower. So I'll just tell you the town, um, you know, I was the first Gibson to go back here probably about 12, 13 years ago. 
and it was I was very shocked about how small it is. Um, you know, when you're in college, you know, if you have a buddy or a friend of yours that's in college and they come from a small town, you say you probably come from a town with one street light. Well, the university has one street light. I thought I would never go to a town that has one street light. They have one street light, they have three restaurants, but they have five churches. So they have five churches. Very, very small town. The other amazing thing for me coming up being from Newark, I never saw cotton. So the first time I ever saw a cotton field when I went back to the University of Georgia. But as you come in, everything is named after Josh Gibson. Their communities are named after Josh Gibson. When you come into the town, it has his name on a water tower. You come into the town, it has Welcome to Hell of Josh Gibson, and now with the name of Mark. So a very, very small, small town. This is a picture of my great grandmother, Helen Gibson, and my grandfather, Josh Gibson. So they were married, uh, well, they were married a year after, but this is a picture right here in the Hill District where Josh played Sandlot in 1938, I mean 1929. The crazy part about this is, is that most recently, um, we just found out that Helen didn't have a grave marker. We never knew this. But let me get into this first. So Helen died giving birth to her twin. So my grandmother never lived very long. Um, she died giving birth to the twins. They were boy and girl twins, so that's Josh Gibson Jr. and Helen. They were named after her parents. That's her sister who raised the kids while my grandfather continued his baseball career. Getting back to the grave marker, just past year, last year, as I said, she died in 1930. We never knew she had a headstone. We just assumed that she had a headstone. Somebody realized that she didn't have one, contacted us, the foundation, and she's actually buried. The crazy part about this is that she's actually, so Josh is buried in Allegheny Cemetery, which is right next to Children's Hospital. And when they told me, they were trying to give me the coordinates, and I'm not, I wasn't good at math, so I said, I need to just drive over and come and see it. Well, the crazy part about it is they're both in Allegheny Cemetery, which, is, which was great, but we were, so as you're going up to Josh's grave, like Josh's grave, so if you've ever been there, it sits on top of a hill in Allegheny Cemetery, so all the headstones are flat, because you could cut the grass. But there's a road that takes you up around the hill. We were actually driving past, her body was like right there. We were actually driving past her body all this time, never knew it. And so we started a grave marker project because I felt like if we didn't know that she didn't have a grave marker, how many other newly families don't know about their descendants having a grave marker? And so we raised $6,000 this year. And we've done eight grave markers so far. Of, uh, and, our, and our grave marker says it's called, uh, if you Google Josh Gibson Grave Marker Project, you'll see the website. But it's very interesting to find out that she never had a grave marker and she died in 1930. So as you saw in there, the Kermelin Post, anybody from Homestead or anything about Homestead? Homestead, Homestead Gray. So Kermelin Posey, I'm gonna give you a little background on Kermelin Posey first. Kermelin Posey is one of two men that's in two Hall of Fames. Only two, only, only two people is in two Hall of Fames. He's in the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame, and he's also in the Basketball Hall of Fame. He's, he was actually the first African American to attend Penn State University as a white person. They thought he was white. This is fair skinned. And so he is in the Hall of Fame for Homestead Gray's baseball and his basketball, because he was a great basketball player. But he was the owner of the he was the owner of Gray's as well as he, he won the title. So if you see where it says Griffin State, Washington, DC, DC did not have a new league baseball team. So Cumberland Posey had a job in with the mayor that they'll play half their games in DC and half the games in Pittsburgh. So if you ever go to the Washington National Stadium, you'll see a Josh Gibson statue there. People say, why is there a Josh Gibson statue in, in, in D.C.? It's because they played half their games in D.C. Inside the Nationals Park, they have a ring of honor. Josh Gibson, other great league baseball players, are also inside of D.C. Stadium. And as you can see, they won the World Series in 1943, 48, I mean, 44 and 48. Now here's a Story, they talked a little bit about this, about Josh's debut, or Chuck did, I should say, in his, in his opening statements. Um, 1930, you know, Judy Josh was the manager of the Grays. You know, and, and people always ask, well, how did Josh get to get started playing baseball? How did he get into it? This is how it happened. He just happened to be at a game. He was playing Sandlot baseball, happened to be at a game. 
and they knew who he was, and they asked him if he were to play in the game. And you hear the old saying, and the rest is history, and I think really that's what happened. I mean, he had a chance to get called because the catcher got hurt, got into the game, and as they say, the rest is history. He was playing baseball ever since and did very well. 1931 Grays team. Um, and this is a lot of stuff from the Homestead Grays right here where it talks about the nine pennants in a row and things like that. And so this is one of the greatest teams in the New League. And I would say just in Major League Baseball, considered in all times because of, as it talks over right here, it says, you know, the Grays won the season series for every white and color team they met. This from Cumberland Posey's Grays owner in the Pittsburgh College, in the Pittsburgh Quarter College. Pittsburgh Quarter All-American Ball Club, the best New League players in 1930 included six players uh, from the Homestead Grays out of 16. Josh Gibson, Judd, Judd Wilson, Oscar Charleston, Smokey Joe Williams, Willie Foster, and Ted, and sometimes I can Ted W. Dewey Radcliffe. And so when you talk about some of the greatest teams in the Negro Leagues, it's not just in the Negro Leagues, it's some of the greatest teams in baseball. So here's some of Josh's stats when he played with the Grays. Uh, so he played with the Grays from 1937 to 1946. As you can see, they, how many times they finished first, how many times they finished second, and those times when he played with the Grays, how many World Series appearances they had, and how many times they won a World Series. Now, I did mention they won a World Series in 1948, but Josh died in 1947, so he was not on that team. So anything about stats, um, I'm going to ask Gavin, it's the baseball player. So if you see this, if you see 1943, you see his batting average. So I don't know, like usually in batting average, if you're hitting 300, anything in the 300 is good. Anything in the 400s is phenomenal. So, and I'll talk about this later on the road, Major League Baseball made an announcement back in 2020 to include Major League stats into Major League Baseball record books. And so I'm actually, I am actually actually serve on a committee, on that committee to make sure that this happened because in 2020, this made the announcement, it's 2023, and, and they've never done anything with it yet. So I've been a big advocate to get this done because we have a Negro League baseball player who's 98 years old. His name is Ron Teasley in Detroit, Michigan. I would love to see his name in the record books before he died. And so um, they started this committee. So 441, will be the top batting average in Major League Baseball as well in the New Year's. And that was the year of 1943. But not only Josh, but Josh and several other New League Baseball players will be in the top 10, top five categories in Major League Baseball records once these stats officially become recognized. So the other great team, which is stuff over here, Pittsburgh Crawfords, and that was the owner of Gus Greenlee. The Pittsburgh Crawfords uh, from 1931 to 38 was in the Hill District of Pittsburgh. Uh, it was actually named after a, a, a grill called the Crawford Grill. And he owned the team. They won the national championships in 1935 and 1936. And here's actually the old picture of the Crawford Grill back in the Hill District on Wiley Avenue from 1933 to 1951. And then also, Gus Greenlee was a very smart man. So Gus Greenlee made his money running numbers, which we call the lottery today. So he made a lot of money. So he was smart. Most of the games were played at Forest Field, so they were rent Forest Field out. Well, he said, well, why would I keep renting for Forest Field? I could just build my own stadium. So he built his own stadium in the Hill District. It was Greenlee Field. And back then, he did an estimated cost, 7,500 people capacity, cost about $100,000 back then, estimated about $1.5 million today's money. But what he did was he felt like he could make his own money and build his own stadium, and that's what he did. Pittsburgh Cropper, this is one of the famous pitchers of the Pittsburgh Cropper 1931 team, considered one of the best teams as well because of the, the, key, the players they had on that team. That was Josh's stats that year, 11 home runs, 63 RBIs, and so on. But the key part about this is, is that this team had five Hall of Famers on that team. So you look at, as they mentioned, Chuck mentioned in the opening, Satchel Page was the first New League baseball player inducted the Hall of Fame in 1971. Josh Gibson was second player inducted the Hall of Fame. Cool Papa Bell, 1974, Judy Johnson in 75, and Oscar Charleston in 1976. You know, when I say these years, I know like the kids probably have no clue 
<laughs> of each year, they probably like 71. What is that? But that's, you know, that's why you call it history. <laughs> but that's why this team, they had five Hall of Famers on that team. No Major League Baseball team had five Hall of Famers on one team at that time. So as I mentioned, like I said, the Latin ball, you know, the Negro League baseball players played baseball all year round, so they called it like they called it never drop the ball. Because Josh played in the Negro Leagues, he also had an opportunity to play in the Latin countries. And so here are some of the pitchers he played in Venezuela, Dominican Republic, he played in Cuba, he played in Puerto Rico, and he played in Mexico. And so there were, we have an article where um, when he was over in uh, Puerto Rico, he didn't want to come back because to the United States. And it's crazy when you read the article because it didn't say Cumberland Posey, the owner of the Grays, said that if he doesn't come back, he's going to sue Josh Gibson and take his house. And I said, well, I didn't say nothing about no contract, no money. And I'm thinking, like, most times when you sue someone, it's about their money. They said he's going to take his house. Nothing about the money. So I guess his house was more valuable, so he came back <laughs> and played with the team. But, um... So, as I mentioned, Vera Cruz about the, the Nike tennis shoe over there. So, that's the picture of the top right corner of Josh playing in, um, in Mexico. And we also have, if you look at if you, if you look, if you look at the photos over there, you saw a, a guy giving Josh Gibson an MVP trophy. And people always ask about artifacts or any kind of number that we have of Josh Gibson. So, we do, I, do, I do have that trophy. Um, that's one of the artifacts that I own. If you saw the uh, the woman who was the Josh Gibson great niece in the video clip, that's my aunt. She's 88 years old. Her mother was Josh Gibson's sister, so a lot of her a lot of his stuff is left at her house. So that trophy that she gave me was left there at the house. Um, we have some passports. We don't have any, people ask about uniforms or or catcher's equipment. We don't have anything like that, but we do have passports, uh, letters that trophy and things like that. I, the thing I have is a trophy, that's it. So, but people always ask about Josh, because it's very hard to find any kind of relay with the new beliefs. And one day, have you ever remember this show called, um, it's called Hidden Treasures. They used to do it down at the High History Center. I sit on the board at the High History Center, I don't, I used to. And they used to always ask me, well, can you bring it down to, be, to get it appraised? Because they have all these different appraisers down there that, that we appraise it. And I never wanted to get it appraised because, you know, when you, when you run a family business, anything that's valuable, then everybody wants it, <laughs> right? And so I said, okay, you know, and, this, and then it's on TV, it's on KDKA, so everybody's going to see it. So I go down there, this is maybe about 10 years ago, I go down there, I get it appraised, and they're looking at it, we have a camera, we're talking about it, and so I'm going to ask you guys a question, uh, I'm going to show you the trophy right here, so this is next on the slide. The swag to go. Okay, that's just the actual. That's the actual trophy right there. And so it was appraised. So I'll ask you a question. How much you think it was appraised for? This is now this is ten. This is about ten years ago. So how much you think it was appraised for? The MVP trophy. It's the MVP 1941-42 MVP trophy original. One point two million. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be sold. It'd be sold. <laughs> It'd be sold as well. <laughs> no, not that high. Not that high. It's in the, it's in the thousands. How I many? Fifteen thousand. No, go high. It's 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 it's, it's less than a hundred thousand back then. How would you say? No, a little higher, higher, huh? Huh? Who said seventy-five? Yep, seventy-five thousand. <laughs> Now, I would never get it, it's probably more, of course it's more valuable now, if you compare it to 10 years ago. But, even though you said 1.2, um, I can't sell it. I can't sell it. Um, because if we, you know, my grandfather, Josh Houston Jr., in his will, he put in that you can't sell none of this stuff, you know. Um, so, and I'm making sure that my kids <laughs> don't sell it either. <laughs> But I may make an option. Somebody offered 1.2 million. Uh, that, 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 that could change your life. So the other thing is, you know, 
when, when Chuck was talking earlier about the Pittsburgh Pirates having the all-black baseball lineup in 1971, here's a, here's a, we talked about a chance where the Pirates had a chance to sign just some of the great New League baseball players. So 1938, there was a telegram wired to Chester Washington, I mean by Chester Washington, the Pittsburgh Court, to the manager at the time, Pine Trainer, and they said, your, your, you know your club needs ball players. Josh Gibson, Bud Leonard, Ray Brown, Satchel Page, Cool Paul Bell are all available. So you figure 1947 was Jackie Robinson with the Colorberry. Here, what, nine, 11 years later, nine years later, Jackie, the Pittsburgh Pirates really took some of the great teams, great players from the teams right here in hometown, the Crawfish and the Grays. And who knows what would have happened? It would have been a dynasty, but of course, he was never answered. And they had some of the greatest black baseball players right in their own city. So people always compare Josh Gibson and Babe Ruth together because of their home run greatness. And people always call Josh Gibson the black Babe Ruth, but as you can see, we say Babe Ruth is the white Josh Gibson. <laughs> and so this is a painting. So one thing about being the descendant of a famous baseball player, you can meet other family members. So Babe Ruth's great grandson, Brent Stevens, a good friend of mine, we came up with this painting called Josh and the Babe. And we, what we did was it was based on diversity because now, as you can see, blacks and white can sit together. Back then, because of the color of their skin, Josh and Babe could never play with each other because of that. And so we went to different ballparks, went to the Hall of Fame, um, educating the youth about diversity and what it meant, and what it meant back in the 1930s and 40s and what it meant to today. And so that's what that was about. Then also, too, it talked about Josh's home. Whereas I don't know if you can see it right here, this one. But he clicked and talked about Josh Gibson's home run in Yankee Stadium. So Josh is considered the only player to hit the ball out of Yankee Stadium. Now, of course, we did some research on this, 580 feet. The ball did not actually go out the stadium. It hit like the top tier of the stadium, which still is the furthest ball hit out of Yankee Stadium. So when I talked to my buddy, now, we, where did Babe Ruth play at? Okay. Yankee Stadium. So that's why I said, you know, it's, he's the white Josh Gibson because Babe Ruth hit a home run that far, right? So he got to he got to be the white Josh Gibson. Hall of Fame that Josh is in. This is plaques over there. As I mentioned, 1970, the state of Pennsylvania is inducted to the Cooperstown Major League Baseball Hall of Fame in 1972. Mexico in 1974, and because he was born in Georgia, he's also in the Georgia State Hall of Fame in the year of 2003. Here's another video clip. Every American boy a chance to excel, not just to be as good as someone else, but to be better than someone else. This is the nature of man and the name of the game, and I've always been a very lucky guy to have worn a baseball uniform, to have struck out or have hit a tape measure or home run. And I hope that someday the names of Satchel Page and Josh Gibson in some way can be added as a symbol of the great Negro players that are not here only because they were not given a chance. I know Casey Stengel feels the same way, and I'm awfully glad to be with him. So on that, on that clip there, it talks about, has there ever been who Ted Williams is? Nobody? Ted Williams, okay. Ted yeah. Williams, Boston Red Sox, he's one of the famous baseball players of all time. And so my grandfather, Josh Houston Jr., he saw his credit Ted Williams for opening the door for the Eagles baseball player. Just, that whole speech is no more than Two, minutes, two to three minutes long. And for him to mention Josh Gibson and Satchel Page in that speech meant a lot because, you know, he didn't have to say that. But the reason why he did say it is because a lot of Major League Baseball players played against Major League Baseball players on Lawrence Story. So even though they didn't play games legally, they played exhibition games against Major League Baseball players. So he knew the great talents of Josh Gibson and Satchel Page. And so he, he went to the Hall of Fame in 1966. Five years later, Satchel Page goes in 1971, and Josh goes in 1972. So we always credited the Williams family for opening those doors to uh, get into league baseball because we felt like Ted Williams helped open those doors in his speech by doing that. So one of the things that we're doing here is, um, so it's another thing that happened. So renaming the MVP award. So back in 2020, Terry Pendleton, Mike Smith, and a guy named Barry Larkin made a big push 
to take the name that was named on MVP Award off. The name on the MVP Award was called the Kennesaw Mountain Landis Memorial MVP Award. Kennesaw Mountain Landis was the commissioner of Major League Baseball at the time who did not over 3,400 African Americans an opportunity to play baseball. So in 2020, the three baseball players just named made a big push to get his name off of the MVP award. And so his name is no longer on the award. The three names are considered naming the award after is Branch Rickey. Y'all know who Branch Rickey is? Okay, so Branch Rickey was the manager of the team of the, of the Brooklyn Dodgers and signed Jackie Robinson. So that's how Jackie Robinson got the chance to play because Branch Rickey was the manager. Frank Robinson, who is the only player to win the MVP award in the American League and the National League played for the Baltimore Orioles. And then, of course, our Josh Gibson. And so this is our MVP campaign. Um, this was a quote that I did for ESPN Undefeated. It just talks about, remember of Josh Gibson, it's not just about him. It speaks to redemption of the Negro Leagues and the salvation of the stars who were denied their dreams of playing ball at the highest level. All they wanted to do was compete against their peers. From, from those from 1947 onward, <clears throat> excuse me, this was their legacy. For those who came before, the Josh Gibson MVP Award will be an act of redemption. And what I mean in poetic justice, and I mean by that is, it's like, how ironic would it be for a guy like Josh Gibson to replace the same person who did not have an opportunity to play baseball? And so to go with this MVP campaign, because you know, we never saw Josh Gibson play. So we use quotes from other players. So here's some famous quotes from different Hall of Famers. Um, Walter Johnson up top, you know, he talks about, you know, there's a catcher at any big league club would like to, uh, to, to, to buy for 200000 His name is Gibson. He can do everything, hits the ball in mouth, he catches so easy, he might be in a rocking chair, throws like a rifle. Too bad this Gibson guy, Gibson is a color fellow. So you go on and on and on, you know, you have the one at the bottom by Barry Bonds, knowing my heart, referring to Gibson. 84 home runs in 1936 belongs to Josh Gibson. If Gibson is the home run king, recognize it. So we use a lot of these quotes, and we did a lot of social media quotes with these uh, quotes talking about how great Josh Gibson was. The other one, the last one was Monty Irvin. The, the third one, it says, he, Gibson, had an eye like Ted Williams in the power of Bay Root. He hit in all fields. I played with Willie Mays and against High Air. They were, they were tremendous players, but they were no Josh Gibson. So we use all these quotes, since I never saw him, but I can't make these statements. So we use other people's statements to help push the MVP campaign. That's our last video clip. We have a catcher in the Negro National League, Josh Gibson. In my opinion, the best hitting catcher I have ever seen. He was boyish and he had charisma. He used to love to be around him. Opposing players liked him, pitchers liked him, even though he killed a pitcher, you know. Mr. Josh Gibson. Well, there are those who will say that Josh Gibson was the black baby group. There are others who saw Gibson play who will call Ruth the white Josh Gibson. Mm. Gibson was incredible. In, in 1936, the great power hitting catcher hit 84 home runs in a single season. In the of 75, 71, and 69 in a single season, he is still believed to be the only man to ever hit a ball completely out of Yankee Stadium. How about Josh Gibson? Did he really hit a fair ball out of Yankee Stadium? Yes, he did. Uh, uh, Josh was one of those uh, superhuman people like that would come along. It'll be a thousand years before another man come along like that. He hit one in the polo grounds that they estimated to travel over 600 feet. And as I said with my visitors, his steroids, ham hocks and collard greens. <laughs> the, man, the man, as we say, from Georgia was just country strong. He could hit that ball and hit it a long way, but he wasn't just a great power hitter. Josh was a great hitter. Like Ted William and Joe Maggio, if you want me to tell you the truth. Lifetime batting average of 354, and in head-to-head -head competition against major leaders, hit over 420. But what makes it even more remarkable if you're a fan of the game, he was doing this as a catcher. And as you well know, Josh wasn't a good catcher. He was a great catcher. Rifle arm. He's throwing guys out from the crowd back in that area. 
So you want to talk about what might he look like? Who might you picture? Just think, Bo Jackson, Bo Jackson. as a catcher. Oh, what a charge! Bo is there. Yo, <laughs> almost separated at birth. Both about six foot six right. As Bo would say, two twenty. Knee in the waist. I'm still trying to get knee in the waist. But Josh was knee in the waist. Big powerful forearm. Big powerful thighs. Great eyes because he was unlike most power hitters. Where most power hitters today, and that over 200 times they might strike out. Gibson might strike out 25, 30 times in a year. He put the ball in play and put it in play with a lot of power. So you saw in the video clip, you know, it talks about Satchel Page talks about Josh Gibson. We and we love this quote, and it says, you know. Josh Gibbs is one of those superhuman people who get a thousand years before another man come along like him. So we use a lot of these quotes in these videos to push up for the MVP campaign. Again, that's Satchel Page right there holding a picture of Josh Gibbs. And they were great friends, even though they played. They played on one team. They played on Latin teams together a lot. They only played on one team with the Crawfords for one year. Josh and Satchel always played because Satchel played with the Kansas City Monarchs, which was their robbery. Um, but you know, just hearing the, these players, Ward Campanella talk about Josh Gibson, those are the things that we use to help push the MVP campaign for people to see how great of a player. And again, like I said, I think for us, it's not about, you know, Josh um, as one player. If Josh was to get the MVP named after him, it would be for the entire Negro Leagues. He'd be re representing the entire Negro League, not just Josh Gibson. And so when I talk about this, so this is Josh Gibson's grave. I'm about to wrap up in a minute. This is Josh Gibson's grave site. And so like I mentioned, he's in Allegheny Cemetery. He died January 20th, 1947, with a brain tumor. Um, and so that's his grave site there. Um, his grave site is one of the most visited sites in Allegheny Cemetery. So it's hard to find. So there's actually markers that take you to his grave site. You'll, you'll see Josh Gibson markers that kind of guide you to his grave site. And like I said, it's just on top of the hill. And so... Josh, that if you all know anything about the baseball history, he never had a chance to play in the major because he died in 1947, which was the same year that Jackie Robinson broke the color grade in 1947. So Josh never had a chance to see Jackie Robinson play in the major leagues. Um, he was 35 years old when he died, and from my understanding is he was having routine, just routine headaches. You know, he didn't really get it checked out, and by the time he did get it checked out, it was already, it was already too late. The tumor had spread, and uh, he passed away. And so, as I mentioned, my, 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 my aunt, who was in the um, video, she was actually about eight years old when Josh died, and she actually was in the, she actually was in the room, because they called her, from what I understand is they called everybody to the house before he passed away. And she was one of the kids that was actually at the house and actually had a chance to see him the day before. And the next day, she said we got the phone call, he had, he had passed away. So this is the ways that we can get involved with the MVP campaign. Um, we have a website, which is joshgibson20mvp.com. You can go on there, we have a petition on there. You can sign the petition to help you remove the MVP campaign. Uh, we hope, we're hoping we should know something about sometime next year about the MVP campaign. But any, any, all petitions, all signatures, it all helps. So that's the website, jg20mvp.com. And uh, you can go here and sign the petition there. And that is the end of my presentation. I will take some questions and answers. I mean, questions. <laughs> <laughs> now I do have some. I do have some prizes. Um, so I usually, after after y'all ask me some questions, then I'm gonna ask you some questions, and based on your answers, you get a prize. So, any questions from the audience? Good question. So the question is, what is Sandlot baseball? So it's like semi-pro. You heard of semi-pro? Yeah. Yeah, it's like semi-pro. Yeah, it was a step before you got into the league release. It was Sandlot baseball. So a lot of players played Sandlot baseball. It was just, just like semi-pro. Right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. No, we don't have any sand in Pittsburgh. <laughs> no, you're right. Good question. That's a great question. Why are you trying to buy it? <laughs> the question was, 
how much would you sell a trophy for? What's your reasonable price you would sell a trophy for? And I asked him, you want to buy it? Um, I don't know, man. It, it happened to be a lot of money, honestly, because, again, I think, you know, when people say things like, here's a statement, priceless, and there's no value. Um, like, for instance, the Hall of Fame just called me. They want to have this on loan for, like, three years, and I'm still kind of leery of even doing that. Because they have a new exhibit coming out called Black Ball, which is coming out next April, and they've been bugging me about this trophy, and I've been kind of like, okay, we'll see, we'll see. But I don't know. It, 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 you know, there's always a number. Hopefully, I'll have to make a decision. So, but as long as I'm living, I'm not selling it. For the oh no, for, so the Hall of Fame, you know, money. <laughs> It'll be so. So what the Hall of Fame does is that they'll put it in display. So the Hall of Fame, it is. It's good to be in the Hall of Fame because everybody goes to the Hall of Fame so you can get more awareness. And we're big on Josh Gibson's brand, but they won't pay you for it. No. Just like if you look at the Hall and so Josh is on a stamp. When you go over there, you'll see him on a stamp. People ask us, do we give you money? The government don't give you no money. The government will take your money, they won't give you no money. So we did not get paid for the stamp. Everything else we got paid for. We didn't get paid for the stamp at all because um, the government feels like to the government, they don't have to pay you. So, yes? So, he only went to ninth grade. How much were they paid back then? And what was the difference between the pay from? Yeah, great question. So, yep, so the question was about the pay. So, all I can go by is his contract. He has some contracts and some write ups. So, I know at one time, so, so, so let me break it down. So, at one contract, he was getting paid like $2,500 a year, one contract. Other contract I saw was five thousand a year. I think the highest I saw was eight thousand a year. Back then, was a lot of money. But Josh's contract also considered gate money because he was a big draw. So most people want to come see Josh Gibson play, so it was sell out. So he would get a percentage of the gate money as well. So him and Sancho paid for two highest baseball players in the league, really, um, based off their contract. And also, as I mentioned, they played overseas, so he also got contracts that way as well. But I don't know if he got gate money overseas or not. I don't see, I never remember seeing any contracts where he had gate money, but he definitely got gate money in the United States as well. Is that because he owned the field? Yeah. He was probably able to independently. Yeah. Who all hit that thing? For sure. Yeah, so that's how they got their pay. They got their original contract plus whatever ticket sales came in. Uh, how much are the nuttings or pirates helping at all? With what? <laughs> to get his name out or something you see it on TV. Yeah, so when we first, it. yeah, so they've done some social media posts. Um, and I don't have this in my presentation, but if you go to, so y'all y'all know the Pirates of the Hall of Fame now? Y'all know that? So last year, the Pirates were their own Hall of Fame. They inducted 19, the first year was their inaugural season, they inducted 19 players into the Hall of Fame for the first year. They just had the induction this year, this August, they did four this year. So within that, um, they included four New League baseball players into the Hall of Fame, and Josh is one of them. So when you go into the entrance by Clemente statue, yeah. <laughs> you see it? Yeah, I <laughs> right, and you go to the right, it's a wall, it's your Hall of Fame, so you'll see the Josh gets some plaque. Yeah, it's called the Hall of Fame entrance. There you go, see? There you go. Um, but I'll tell you a quick story about since you brought up Nutty, the Pirates. So I got a call and they said, hey, you know, we want to um, induct Josh into the into the into the in Pirates Hall of Fame, and so you know, like I said, we're big on Josh Gibson's brand, and so I said to uh, the guy who contacted me, I said, well, I said, well, how are you going to induct Josh into your Hall of Fame? He never played for the Pirates, you know. So he said, no, don't, don't worry about it. Your letter, when you get your letter, it'll explain everything. I said, okay. So we got our letter. Of course, it didn't explain nothing. <laughs> so I called him back and said, listen, you know, because the reason why I wanted to know that because, you know, when you're going to the Hall of Fame, you get a lot of media attention, and people want to ask questions. So I want to make sure I could be able to address those questions accordingly. So the president of the Pirates called me, and I said to him, I said, hey, you know, I want to make sure that we understand that we want to know why you're putting a non-power player into your Hall of Fame. 
And they said, well, you know, they gave us all the, well, it's the right thing to do, and it's overdue, and I'm just like, it was all wrong answers, you know? So I, then I said something, I said, well, let's do this. I said, won't you sign to a one-day contract? And there'll be a fire for one day, right? So y'all know who I'm talking about. I'm just going to say their name. The power president said, you know, that's a great idea. Let me take it back and get back to you. And so I travel a lot more. I do a lot of minor league baseball contracts where I do maybe the trivia nights. So I'm in Boston. And no, before that happened, they called me back and said, no. I was like, no. I said, OK. And if you saw all the advertisement, all the advertisements for the Hall of Fame, Josh was in everything. He was all the poster, the billboards, and we wrote him a nice letter, basically saying, "Well, Josh should take Josh off, take Josh off the Hall of Fame, you know." I can't do a one-day contract, and which is not costing anything, and it's great publicity for them. So now I'm in Boston, and the president is blowing my phone up, and I know he's calling. I'm not, I'm not answering the phone on purpose. I'm letting nobody call me, call me, call me. So I finally answer the phone. And the first thing he says when he said, Sean, we didn't mean to make you upset. He said, we're sorry to make you, make you upset. And I said, first of all, I'm not upset. I'm disappointed. It's a difference. I said, because all you had to do is sign you got to a one-day contract. And that answers all the questions of how you honor. Because I'm friends with Al Oliver, Manny Sandin. None of these guys are going to the Hall of Fame. And I felt like they probably deserve it better than some of these guys. And so, make a long story short, it was two weeks before <laughs> the thing. They said, yes, go do it. I said, okay. So we get there, and they had these contracts, and they're already framed. And I'm like, no, we got to sign the contract. I said, no. And I was just, it's just like, come on, man. I'm like, nope. I said, I'm not, I said, I'm not, because they had this, it was something like this for the stage. I said, they showed me, I said, I'm not going out there to y'all do that. So they went back upstairs, they got it out. And so they had the contracts. So as they called our name to get the award, we signed the contract, <laughs> and then they did it. So that's the story of the night right there. To answer your question, the ball was Sherrington or Lincoln can't even do that. Right. Can't even do that. Right. <laughs> but we hope they get a winning team soon. So the uh, prize been a long loser, but we hope they get a winning team soon. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Yes? OK. Who? Chloe? That close. Little sister. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you got a question? <laughs> All right. So I, I, I did I did bring a couple of jars for some t-shirts. And you can scan those QR codes, they work. <laughs> so I'll, I'll ask a couple of questions to the audience. And the shirts, they only, they only come in two sizes, a small, extra large. So we got grays and we got cropper shirts. So I'll ask a question. My first question would be, so this is back in the beginning of the video. Do y'all know who the voice was on that video? Do you know who the narrator person was on that voice of the video? A very famous voice. Nope. Nope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bill Hillbro. Right, right. Hill bro. You want what shirt you want? You raise or this is an extra large, these are small. You say small. Small. Yeah, Bill Hill Bro. I thought y'all want y'all you know the over games? You did it. <laughs> You see his face, but not the name. Right, Bill, Bill Hillbro was the voice of the documentary. Okay, so the next question would be, um, can we see? What year did Josh Gibson's wife die? Uh, Nineteen thirty. Okay. Oh, she whispered to you. She, 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 she was cheating. <laughs> what's that? What's she, okay? You wanna come get? Sure. She got it. Okay. Take a pass. I got you. 
All right. So the next question would be, um, I'm trying to think. I don't. I don't. Make, I don't want to make it too hard. So, um, okay, this is a kind of a hard question. It was in here though. What did y'all was paying attention? I should have told you to pay attention to that. So, <laughs> hey, beforehand, what year did Josh Gibson make his debut with the Homestead Rays? 1938. Nope. 14 that Josh played in Latin countries? Can they move? Ted Williams, what year did he go to the Hall of Fame? So the guy who was speaking about Josh gets in the shot on page. Well, if you got a shirt already, if you got a shirt already, we don't want y'all to answer. 66. Come on up, old man. 66. Want to come get a shirt? 1966. The same colors, same colors you were. Oh, we got one. We got, we got one left. I'll make this one real hard. <laughs> Takes to probably get it. <laughs> um, all right. So I should. This is Josh's home run. I pointed. How long was his home run at Yankee Stadium? Gavin. Five forty-eight. No, no, five fifty-eight. Nope. No, no. Okay, no. I want to. Five eight. All right. Here you go. All right. Here you go. Well, that's it for me, Chuck. I gave up my gifts. Well, first of all, I want to say thank y'all for coming. I really hope y'all learned a little bit more about Josh Gibson. Thank you. Uh, go to our website to learn more, joshgibson.org. If you need me out South Allegheny, I'll come out to South Allegheny. You would? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you go to the Power Game, you'll see the Hall of Fame. Josh is the Hall of Fame there. So. Hey, how about another round of applause for Sean? Before we leave, if you want to look at the stuff, all I say is just please don't touch anything. But you, you're welcome to look at all this stuff before we wrap up. Thank you. 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 Thank He's the kickoff for our, our speaker series, 1.5. We had a little something that went on um, last spring, and this is like really first that we really did in person. And so thanks for being part of the inaugural. It's going to grow. We want to bring Sean back because we just have to. Um, but what I am going to do is, I'm going to showcase. 
So this is our speaker series right now. So as you see, we just had it on tonight. Two weeks from tonight, somebody did it. Somebody <laughs> got it <in> me. <laughs> uh, my daughter Vanessa is going to be here. She's a national celebrity. She has, she's a host on QBC, has three shows. She's going to talk about her career, how she started off uh, as a 13-year-old, winning a contest to be the host of the McDonald's Steelers Kids Zone. And now in her mid-30s, she has been on TV for over 20 years and is doing amazing things. Super proud of her. So please come on out. It's going to be phenomenal. Uh, we have her coming up in uh, November 1. But then December 7, one of our partners, UPMC, Children's Hospital Foundation, Noelle Conover. She is a phenomenal woman. Her story is incredible because her son died from pediatric cancer. She was very angry. But UPMC, Children's Hospital, kept reaching out to her, kept contacting her, kept contacting her. And what they did was they finally convinced her to turn her anger into something productive. And she realized that, you know, I have the the means and wherewithal to be able to do something with this anger. And so she actually created Matt's Maker Spaces, which is a STEAM program. It started off by donating a STEAM room to Children's Hospital, and now they have donated over 50 STEAM rooms in the region, in different school districts in Western Side. Uh, she's going to be donating another 10 this year, and she's going to be coming to talk about tell her story, and tell how she also is an advocate for parents who are going through the trauma of possibly losing a child through cancer. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be powerful December 7th. Bill Eisler is coming on January 11th. South Allegheny knows Bill Eisler. Bill Eisler is like my, my adopted dad. <laughs> He's an amazing man. He is the president and CEO emeritus of Fred Rogers Company. For those of you who don't know who Fred Rogers is, that is actually Mr. Rogers. <laughs> so Bill was going to come and talk about how he and Mr. Rogers and the things they did to build this up to the brand that it is right now all the way through the Amber Tigers neighborhood and just talk about a bunch of other stuff and probably embarrass me. So <laughs> uh, February 8th, we have Joseph Yoon, Dr. Yoon. How many of you have heard Chat TV? <laughs> Dr. Yoon is one of the fathers of artificial technology, artificial intelligence. He worked at Google on the team that started this about a dozen years ago. And now he is Pitt's AI architect. He's also the founder of Blue Fox Labs AI. And I tell you how, many, how powerful he is. He's a South Bay resident, but he was on his way to move to Singapore. And Pitt said, we need you to stay here. And if you work for any university, any property, anything that you create at the university becomes a property of the university. And he was like, hey, if I'm staying here, all of my property stays with me. And they said, OK. And he said, also, I want to be able to make up my own title. And they said, OK. So that's how he became the artificial intelligence architect. So he's coming. And he actually is phenomenal. He can take this complicated stuff and make it so that the five-year-old can understand it. Great storyteller. Justin Jorgen Pedersen, their story is incredible. Jess um, and Jorgen are married. Uh, Jorgen dropped out of college, started waiting tables, realized that, that wasn't the life for him. Went back to school, went to Carnegie Mellon, and he actually, they, he started a company, he and his wife. She was the marketing person. He was the builder person, and they started RE Squared Robotics. They ran it for 20 years. Two years ago, they sold it for over nine figures. So, and on top of that, they were unable to have children of their own, and they adopted two young black children, and I call them, for this is a dated reference, 
but I call them the drones. And those of you who know, will know. <laughs> In April, we have Zach Betts. Zach is a South Bay alum. Zach is on the um, autistic spectrum. He actually has Asperger's. And Zach, for the longest time, till eighth, ninth grade, wouldn't really talk. And then, I'll tell you the day that he started talking, Heidi, you were there. It was the day before the world came, came to an end, March 12, 2020. We were all together. And Zach started saying things, and they were so profound and so amazing that I was like, oh my goodness, we have to get you up in front of people. But then I put, jokingly, I tell Zach, hey man, you didn't talk, and now you won't be quiet. So, <laughs> but Zach actually has a viral uh, TED talk called The Benefits of Autism. Zach is coming to speak on uh, April 4th. And then finally, Champions of Hope. Those are our faculty members. They're actually all talking about what I haven't really, Dr. Maurer, could you give yeah. me a little bit of help with that? Yeah, so that, we have a team of, teacher, of team of teachers that are studying the power that hope has. So they're doing a, a case study and they're working together, um, kind of studying research on what hope can do to bring about joy and change. Um, so we're going to have that team of teachers that are working right now um, on that, speaking on what they've kind of discovered. So that'll be the, the end of our entire speaker series, but... So this is something we've been working, working on. We're so proud to provide it. And as I said, those sponsors and partners have really brought this to the next level. We can't thank you guys enough for being here. We want you to spread the word now. Absolutely. So please do. Please help us by getting the word out that there are some some really great speakers, obviously coming to uh, enlighten us. So um, please spread the word. Get the word out in the community, and we'd love to see even more people at our next one. And before you know, everybody, this is going to be filled up. I mean, I love Sean. But Vanessa, y'all better be here for <laughs> Vanessa. <laughs> um, but before you go, I also want to, what's the website again? JG20MVP.com. JG20MVP.com. Put that out there. Sign the petition. Get everybody that you know to sign the petition. I saw there were like 3,500 people on there, and the goal was 5,000. We can get 1,500. I know South Allegheny can get 1,500. Definitely look at that. They're like, yes, we can. So we can make that definitely happen. So, hey, JG20 MVP. JG. So, again, like Dr. Mauer said, we just want to thank you for coming out tonight. Really appreciate you. And it was like a super weird, busy night. Yeah. Ball league, baseball, volleyball game, football game under the lights. So I'm like, what the heck? None of this stuff was in our radar when we decided this night. So next time we're going to fill it up for you because we're going to bring uh, Mr. Gibson back. Another round of applause. Mr. Yeah. Gibson. Thank you so much. And have a wonderful night. Check out the stuff over there. Don't touch it again. <laughs>